Hello everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for kicking off Women's History Month with us tonight. It does start today. Uh, and tonight we are going to learn about some of the women of Pennsylvania that helped make the Pennsylvania uh, early iron industry a success. I am here tonight, my name is Leanne, I'm the Education Manager for the museum here, and I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight, his name is Dan Graham, he is a local iron historian, uh, he is also focused in the uh, Potts and Rudder families, I believe, and he is here to tell you about some of these special women in Pennsylvania's iron history. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dan Graham. Thank you. Um, good evening. Oh, I do have an extra one here. Has anyone ever heard me talk before? One. That's funny, because, boy, I've been doing this for 30 years uh, in this area. So, I mean, Chester County is my patch here that I, I speak at a lot. So um, we'll talk about a bunch of things. Um, anyhow, my name's Dan Graham. I've been doing this for a while. I'm a, I consider myself a Potts Rudder historian, and they're the folks that kind of started the industry. Um, Jim asked me, Ziegler asked me to do a talk. He said you could kick off Women's Month, and he provided something like Chester County women. And I'm thinking, how many women does he think there were in the iron industry, hundreds or something? But so we, 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 we narrowed it a little bit, but then we, he let me say just women in the Pennsylvania iron industry. And after that, I'm going to be talking about all women in Chester County, so I don't know why I was concerned. This discussion is going to pretend or at least assume you know who Rebecca Lukens is because I'm not going to talk about her. Um, who was she? Who was she? <laughs> well, I always, I'm not trying to be mean here, but I always thought somebody, she, she should have had a better picture taken of her, that's all. That, that picture is, is not much. But anyhow, I'm going to compare the person I'm talking about to her, and I'll talk a little bit about her, but that just assumes you knew, know that she was the first woman industrialist in the United States. And I'm going to talk about somebody that was 100 years before her. Um, anyhow, my talk's going to be about uh, somebody named Anna Rudder Savage Nutt and her daughter Rebecca Savage Nutt Grace. They got, both got married twice, they were widowed twice, so they have a few extra names. Um, I'll go over the handouts with you. Uh, the first one, maybe, oh look at that, it's a uh, picture of Warwick Furnace, so we're, and that's where Anna Nutt was, and that's what we're going to be talking about. It's <coughs> unique because it was done I forget the date. It's either 1812 or 1803, but it was done by a guy named uh, Benjamin Latrobe, and it's Warwick Furnace. If you know anything about a furnace, here's the furnace. Here's where they put the cart and rolled stuff right across, dumped it in. Um, so it's it's the earliest known picture of any iron work around. So there it is, and it was in its heyday at that time. Um, I provided. Something on the Chester County iron industry. That would be your fourth page. Or these pages aren't numbered. So it says Chester County iron industry 300th anniversary. I'm not going to talk about that other than this is the year that Chester County celebrates 300 years. So I put that in there to try to gin up a little interest and so on. Uh, if you want to read about Chester County, it's there. Um, I'll be talking about a, a Warwick Furnace, which is in Chester County. But um, I'm not going to talk about the iron industry in general. Um, I have a list in the back of colonial Chester County iron people. And some of those are in color. And those are the people that I will be talking about tonight. It's our last one. You know this, you don't get one. Uh, so anyhow, that's, uh, those are the number of iron works that were in Chester County prior to uh, well, 1837 is the date. Um, I have a two genealogy charts in here. One I did. It's the last page. And I talked to Leanne, and she said, "Ah, you know, that's a little, a little heavy there." So I was at Applebee's waiting for my wife, having a yingling, and I drew this one, and we'll talk about it. And that's the, the you know, the beer coaster I used for the lines, and it, it. it but it's, I, I agree, it's, it's easier to try to figure out rather than this. If you want the hardcore information, it's on these pages. But who we'll be talking about will be on these pages, and I'll, I'll get into that. So anyhow, if there's no other questions, uh, I'm going to start. Okay. Um, 
Ooh, there it is. Well, let's talk about this first, as a matter of fact. We're going to be talking about this woman right here soon. <clears throat> Her parents, Thomas Rudder, he founded the iron industry, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit just to give you an overview. She was married twice. She married a man named Samuel Savage and a man named Samuel Nutt. Samuel Nutt was the second person to make iron in Chester County, and we'll talk about that. She had five children, six children actually. One supposedly died by the bite of a rattlesnake, but she had one, two, three, four, five. Two daughters, three sons. These folks were all involved in the Warwick Iron. Uh, this daughter here married twice, married Samuel Nutt Jr., not senior, Jr. He died, she becomes a widow again, and she married Robert Grace. So they had two marriages. Her mother had two marriages. She married her uncle. No, no, she married her, that was her cousin, probably. I don't know. Let me tell you, doing nut and rudder, uh, nut rudder pots research, whatever you get from marrying your cousins for like three generations, all these folks had. My wife's related to them, that's what I kid her a lot. But there was, they kept the, fa the money in the family. You married your cousin because, you know, you didn't want the money going outside. The last person that we talk about a little bit is John Potts. He ends up taking over for Ann and Nutt. She relieves once he gets involved. He's the one that founded Pottstown. All right. Ooh, that's way on. Okay. I'll leave that up there. All right. Overview of the Pennsylvania iron industry. This is just to give you a background. 1716, Anna's father, that guy up there, okay, comes up to the Manitani Creek, up through Berks County, uh, and founds Rudder's Bloomery. He builds a bloomery, which is a, a, an early forge. He does it at Pine Forge. If you go into uh, Pottstown from the west, uh, where you're headed east into town, and you get to the creek, the Manitani Creek, and go left, up Manitani Road, That'll take you right to Pine Forge. That's where the first forge in Pennsylvania was, the first ironwork. Okay, in 1718, it's followed by a guy named Samuel Nutt, who comes to Chester County, and we're going to talk about him. He was Anna's husband, and his, he, he opens a, uh, he also builds a bloomery forge, and his is located at Warwick Park. If you know where, if you ever get over that side of the county, Warwick Park, at the, at the forks of the uh, French Creek, that's where he builds his first bloomery forge. Okay, so it's Chester County's 300th anniversary because he does it in 1718. All right, let's talk a little bit about Anna's father, Thomas Rudder. Okay, Thomas Rudder's born 1660. He came over from Cheshire, England in 1682. He was a Quaker, and that's going to play into Anna's life. He was a Quaker. He later became a Keithian Quaker and later became a Seventh-day Baptist. But he was a blacksmith, and he earned his livelihood as a blacksmith. In 1716, there wasn't much difference in the skill set you needed to make iron that a blacksmith didn't have because they just hammer rocks, in effect. So the early guys were blacksmiths. They weren't iron, you know, they, they didn't come from the iron industry of England. Um, at that time, England sent all the colonies iron. The colonies produced no iron. Pennsylvania produced no iron in the 1600s. They got it on sh off ships from England. England got it from Sweden. Sweden would make pig iron, okay, send it to England, who made wrought iron, who sent it to the colonies to make guns, hinges, straps, so on. Um, okay, um, he marries a servant from Pensbury named Rebecca Staples, the woman up there. She was a servant there. And for working at Pensbury, which is Penn's Manor up in Bucks County, he's given a plot of land in Germantown. Uh, and he becomes their blacksmith. Anna's born in Germantown. Um, Thomas Rudder serving in the assembly in 1713. In 1714. Okay, in 1714, Queen Anne of England dies. Now, how could we possibly care that Queen Anne died? What happens was uh, Parliament had passed in 1702, I believe, an act of succession. 
They said to make sure that they didn't have the problems with the Catholics and the Protestants that happened with prior, prior uh, monarchs, that they would, is that me? <laughs> well, is it you? Um, <laughs> as long as they, they had to have a Protestant ruler. Queen Anne dies without any children. So they get out the genealogical chart that was probably done not at Applebee's, <laughs> and they, they find you know Queen Anne, and they come up and go over, and the next in line is a cousin named Charlotte. Charlotte got married off to a Hanoverian king, a king in Hanover, Germany. Germany wasn't unified yet, but it was the province or whatever they called the duchy. I'm not, I should know that, but I don't, of Hanover. And lo and behold, there's a guy there, George of Hanover, okay? And suddenly, George is the king of England. Um, how does that affect anything? Hanover happens to be at war with a bunch of other countries with Sweden. Uh, George doesn't know much. He doesn't speak English. He doesn't speak German. He speaks Hanover. He comes over. There's nobody even in England that can speak what he's speaking. They find a guy that came with him that, that speaks Latin who speaks to an Englishman who speaks Latin, who then tells the parliament and the Englishman what to do. So this, it, it's the game we played when we were in school, you know, post whatever it was, mail, you know, say something by the time it gets here. So, but George knew one thing about England. They had a navy. Suddenly it was his navy. He sends the navy over to Sweden, blockades Sweden, stops the iron from coming in. Now in a couple years, they, the Swedish iron would send it to Finland, who put it on Finnish ships that came. But for a brief time, there's no iron coming into the country. Now, Thomas Rudder knows what this means. He depends on iron, okay, for his livelihood. In the assembly, they had talked about what happens if the iron gets shut off a couple times. So now they figure out what's <coughs> happening. The iron's shut off, and Thomas Rudder goes up to the Manitani region, which is now up, the, up where Pine Forge is, it's, it's the Amity Township, and sets up his first iron bloomery. A bloomery, and I'm real high here, it looks like this, except it's much bigger. They put charcoal in it, they blow air in it, up. They put rocks of iron ore in it, okay? It doesn't melt the iron ore, it's not like a furnace, but it gets it gooey. They take it out, <coughs> beat it with a hammer, beat it, that's Pittsburghish, beat it with a hammer, put it back in, okay, and keep doing that. And it gets gooey. I've seen it done twice. The guy had a long pole, a steel pole, and he put it in and it, it attached itself to the thing. And he would keep putting that in and he would keep getting more on the end. And it came out like a flower bloom. Okay, they beat it with a hammer, came out with a bloom. Okay, now why they're doing that, they're getting rid of the impurities. There's a lot of crud with the iron ore. That gets rid of that. But they were called bloomery iron. Okay, so in 1716, Rudder starts producing iron. Now he can produce as much iron as he wants up in Pine Forge, but if he doesn't get it to his market, where's his market? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. If he doesn't get it to Philadelphia, he can produce as much iron as he wants. So he has to figure out how to get it to Philadelphia, get into roads and stuff. But anyhow, his son-in-law, by chance, is Samuel Savage. And by chance, he's a stonemason. And if you're going to build a bloomery forge, a refinery forge, and a coal blast furnace, which he's going to do by 1720, it's good to have a stonemason. Savage isn't mentioned, but I'm pretty sure that Savage was with him because Savage buys land right next to Rudder. Okay, so 1720, Rudder builds a, a refinery forge. A refinery forge and a, a coal blast furnace. Coal blast furnace is one of, on the front, you can look on the front, it's that where they take stuff, dump it in the top, and it's such hot that it melts the iron. It comes out and they put it in something called pigs that look like piglets. The iron runs out and just goes into the, in the things. And they make bars about, well, I've seen really big bars, but I, the couple that are left, I've seen they're about that big. Okay, they then take those, which is pig iron, very brittle. It's good for making castings, 
but it's not good for anything else. They take it to a refinery forge that has a big hammer on it, and they reheat it, and this big hammer just hits it. And it changes the carbon content and makes it wrought iron, which is malleable. Okay. So, um, Pennsylvania iron industry is off and running. And for over the next 50 years, as we know, numerous iron works are built. Okay. Women in the iron industry. Now, my task tonight was to talk about women in the iron industry. And I came up with some theories on it. Uh, you can jump in at the end when we want. But between 1716 and the Revolution, a large number of forges and furnaces are built. They're mostly in Berks and, and Chester County. If you mark where the furnaces are, you'll see where the iron ore is in Pennsylvania. It's there. I'm not building a, a furnace down here if the iron ore is up here. Now, when the site, when Lukens was built down here, they had something called railroads. Okay. They had steam engines. They had a bunch of things that didn't require that it, that it be near the resources. Okay, but anyhow, it's the iron that develops the industry. Without iron, there wouldn't be an iron industry in Pennsylvania. Over the next 50 years, a production and distribution system are developed. They figured out how to produce it. They figured out how to get it to Philadelphia. They figured out how to get stuff back from Philadelphia up. Okay. As they get bigger, there were, um, there were a variety. They, they had workers. The workers needed to be fed. The workers needed to be housed. Okay, the animals needed to be fed. The animals needed to be housed. There needed to be books kept. Suddenly, you had this big company sort of growing. All right. Outlets were established in Philadelphia. But most of these furnaces and forges, particularly the forges, because they didn't require a whole lot of people that I put in the, in the paper there, were family-run businesses. They were small businesses. Okay, they weren't um, big corporations. And when you have family-run businesses, partners are involved, husbands and wives. It wasn't the wife said, okay, you know, you go over there and do it, and I, I won't get anywhere near it. I, Women had to be involved in that stuff for a couple reasons. One is often the woman's father was the iron guy. And the husband got married into the family and suddenly, so it's not like they're going to say, oh, this is, you know, you can't get involved anymore. It was the woman that had it first. Often it was the woman's money that paid for the place. So I'm thinking that Women help run the business in general. I'm going to get real specific here, but I'm saying in general, and they're not in the books or the whatever, women were involved. So, you know, they were. Now, it was particularly critical during the revolution. Why the revolution? Because the guys left, okay, and the ladies were there. And we're going to talk about that right now. All right. I was listening to my wife and her two sisters talk. And they have 10 children. It was over Christmas. They have 10 children, nine boys, one girl. And the three ladies were talking about their daughters-in-law. Not in a mean sense, just how it was different from them. And my one sister-in-law, I remember her saying, women today, my, da my daughters-in-law have it easier than we had it. Now, you heard that. Your parents would tell you that. We, everybody's their kids have it easier than they had it. But it reminded me of something. I was in the archives. I worked in Washington, D.C. Uh, sometime the traffic was so bad, you just, you, instead of sitting in it, you did something. And I'd go to the Library of Congress, or I would go to the archives. And I was looking up Civil War pensions. And they had something called Revolutionary War pensions. I didn't even know there were any. Uh, so I started looking. I'm turning the crank, because it's microfilm, and it's dark. And, and I, I saw Forge, so I stopped and I went back. In about seven, 1835, uh, widows were able to file for Revolutionary War pensions. And you had to put where the husband, what battles they were in, or who they served under, or who their captain was, just general stuff. And on the back of this, I'll, I'll, it's 45 years and I remember it distinctly, the woman said, the young women today don't know how lucky they had it. When Joe, and this was a Western, it's now in West Virginia. It was a Western Virginia forge. It was one of the Zane forges. Um, 
they don't know how lucky they had it. When Joe went, and it was, his name wasn't Joe, but it was Isaac. But when Isaac went to war, that was it. I had to run the forge. I had to raise the kids. I had to plow the ground. I had to, you know, he was gone. And he Dilly came back. I had to run things. And she was saying it was hard work. It was hard. And I found two things uh, that sort of supported that. All right, and if you turn to your handouts, somewhere in there, because they're not numbered, should be something on. Page two. All right. Polly Taylor. Now, Polly Taylor's father was John Taylor. So she, her father was the forge guy. He had died. She had married Persifer Frazier, who's from Chester County, who started running the forge. Okay. Um, during the Revolution, Persifer goes and joins the militia. He's a captain. He gets captured at the Battle of Brandywine. They throw him in the Walnut Street Prison. They had him on a prison ship for a while, but he's in the Walnut Street Prison. They send, British send a detachment to Polly Taylor's house to take things, whatever, because they know that Percival Frazier was in the, and it was a captain. And uh, I, can't, I couldn't find it. I didn't have enough time to find the book. It's in, there's her journal in, the, in Chester County. It's fascinating. She fights off the British. She won't let, she blocks the door. You know, she had her silver in here and she says, you can't come in. And, and they didn't, they were gentlemen. And, but she runs the forge while he's in prison. He comes back, he becomes a general and goes to war again and she runs the forge again. Mm. Okay, so that's one. Second one, and all I'm doing is making a general case here that women were, in, it wasn't Rebecca Lukens or it wasn't Anna Nutt, it was women were involved. Okay, Nancy Ann Coleman. This was great. I found this at Lancaster County about three years ago. If you get a chance, read that, okay? Nancy's the same thing. When they initially, Pennsylvania initially had militia, they called everybody up. Now, after the reorganization, they had classes. So they only call class one up and class two up. I'd be in class seven, you know. That'd be like the sick and the wounded in me. But the younger guys were in class one and so on. And that did it, made it a little easier. But Nancy Coleman's husband, Robert Coleman, gets called up. Now her father ran the forge, had, had owned the forge, and Coleman comes in, marries her, and now he's running the forge. Okay, but it, she talks about how hard it is, and, and hey, don't worry about it while you're away. I'm gonna run things, and I love you, and don't let the ruffians, what is it there? Don't, I hope we won't be molested by those ruffian, ruffians who destroy, who attempt to destroy our dearest friends and leave us to mourn our fate. Great letter. All right. Okay, so again, I'm trying to make the case that women were involved, but I'm going to talk about two more, 100 years before Rebecca Lukens. All right. Who was Anna Rudder Savage Nutt? And why are we going to talk about it? Okay. I'll give you her background. She was born in, uh, she's the oldest child, as I said, of Pioneer Iron Master Thomas Rudder. Rudder's had 10 children, maybe 11. I never really quite figured it out whether one of them was a child or not. They were originally Quakers. Her birth is recorded at the Philadelphia meeting, so we know exactly when she was born. Um, she was born in Germantown. She was raised next to the blacksmith shop. Like all kids, she played at the blacksmith shop, like Rebecca Lukens, who played at Brandywine. Okay, so she played with them. She was the oldest kid, and I'll talk about that. In her early life, before she married Samuel Savage, I found one thing that was unique, that, that was sort of out of place. She and Samuel Savage, before they got married, she was not married to him, went halves on a plot of land in Germantown where he had his masonry. His, his stone yard. So she's now a partner of him, I think. I don't, it was, it was weird. It was, it, but it, it, so she, on her own, a signature, this is a weird to find a woman's signature on this, they bought the land. They weren't married yet. Okay, she marries him in 1704. Um, 
They had six children, as I mentioned, five die. I mean, one dies, five, five hang in there. In 1716, the Savage family moves to Amity Township next to Thomas Rudder. He buys 500 acres. He buys 800 acres, but he sells 300 to his brother. And four years later, in 1720, Samuel Savage dies. All right? All right. So Samuel Savage now dies. She's 39. She has five or six children. Okay, and she's a widow. At that time, someone came and appraised, you got somebody of, of a knowledge of your property, came and appraised the estate. Guess who comes and appraises her estate? Old unmarried Samuel Nutt over here. Okay, and they get married five years later. So who's Samuel Nutt, and why do we worry about old Sam? Let's talk about him, because he's the second link in Pennsylvania's pioneer iron families. The first one's Thomas Rudder, the second one's Samuel Savage. These two guys had a monopoly on the early Pennsylvania iron industry for years. Okay, so who's he? He's a Quaker. He's listed as a weaver on a deed I found. You didn't need to know anything about iron to be an iron guy back then. I think you could just learn it. Um, Polly's, Polly's uh, Taylor's father was a doctor, and he ended up being an iron guy. Nuts from Coventryville, which was in Warwick, Shower, Sire, Shire. These names certain to figure out how they got names in Chester County. So he was from Warwick, Shower, Shire. He comes over in 1714. He buys 1,250 acres in England. I bring it up just because it's neat, because you got, you paid for 1,250 acres of land in Pennsylvania. You didn't know where it was. So you went to the land office, and then I get 1,250 acres. Where is it at? They looked at him and said, oh, we got some land over in Sadsbury, which is near Lancaster. So that was where his land was. But he didn't get involved in that. Okay, because the same time he came over, Thomas Rudder was developing the iron industry, and it was some excitement. There was stuff in the paper. There was stuff in, you know, the talk in the town. Philadelphia wasn't that big. So he gets involved in, an, in the iron industry. In 1717, Samuel Rudder, and we're really early on here, 1717 is pretty early. He warrants land for an iron mine, okay? And it's a very good iron mine. And there's some crazy story that, that uh, a historian came up with, it gets repeated, it's goofy, that, he, uh, that an Indian chief took him and showed him where the land was and he gave, her, gave him an iron pot. And the iron pot story gets stored. But, Anyhow, if it was true, it was a fortuitous pot because, again, it's the best, it's the most successful iron mine, second successful iron mine in Pennsylvania. It supplies all the Chester County forges and furnaces for up until 1890s it finally closed. Um, he replicates Thomas Rudder. He builds a bloomery forge. He takes on two partners, Mordecai Lincoln. Who's Mordecai Lincoln? Does anybody know? That's uh, Abraham Lincoln's grandfather. Great-grandfather, Great right. Okay, he's an iron guy. He brings him on, and he hires a guy named, brings on a guy named William Branson. Branson's a, a um, Philadelphia merchant. He has a store. What's good about a store? You can sell stuff at it. So suddenly, nuts, irons, going to Philadelphia, it's sold at the store. Okay. Um, can we turn the heat down? Because people are <laughs> going fast. <laughs> like the preacher you didn't like. Uh, I don't know if Sam can open that door or whatever. Is there anything we can do? No. How about the back door? It's off. I mean, the back door, can we open and get a no, breeze, man? Oh, geez. <laughs> all right. Well, good luck with all that. All right. Um, he takes some partners, William Branson. Branson's um, has as a Quaker with excess capital. They create a furnace and a finery forge, and it's the second one in Pennsylvania. Okay, um, nut is to production as Branson is the distribution. They bring distribution skills to the, to the area. They figure out how to get to Philadelphia. All right, at the same time, nut brings over this guy, Samuel Nutt Jr. We don't know who he is. Nutt calls him his nephew. He calls him his namesake. He calls him his son-in-law. Okay, because remember, after he marries Anna, he's the stepfather to these five people. Okay, 
But it doesn't matter who he is. It's an arranged marriage. It appears to be a successful one. And um, they get married. In 17, what do I have? 35, I think. She's young. She's maybe 16, 17. The problem with the savages is they didn't go to church that I know of. And without having church records, it's hard to find anything back that far back. Okay. Um, so in 1739, um, he dies. And the daughter here becomes a widow. Samuel Nutt dies. Anna Nutt becomes a widow. Okay. In his will, in Samuel Nutt's will, on the handouts, if you go to something that says Samuel Nutt's will, it doesn't have a page, but page it's a page three. Page three. Okay. He has a very long will because he's a very rich guy. He's one of the richest guys in Chester County. I likewise give unto her, Anna. He doesn't give it to anybody. He gives it to her. And what's he tell Anna in his will? Somebody want to tell me? Build a furnace. Build that. Because what had happened, William Branson and he got into a fight. And Branson, on his own, outside of the company, builds Redding Furnace, if you've ever heard of that. Okay, it's outside. So Nut says, well, hmm, I'm going to build my own. So he builds Warwick Furnace, but he dies. He lived long enough probably to give help on how to do it. But who's he tell to build it? His wife. And after that time, we have Anna Nut and company and Rebecca Nutt and company run Warwick Furnace. They build it and they run it. Okay, a hundred years before Rebecca Lucan, Anna Nutt builds a furnace. Okay, pretty cool, I think. All right, between 1739 and 1740, the mother-daughter team run, the, run, the, run Warwick. But, oh, I have to wait a second. But she quits early. She marries a guy named Robert Grace, okay, and only runs it for two years. After that time, Grace runs it. Grace runs half. She owns half, she owns half of Warwick. Warwick becomes the biggest iron producer in Pennsylvania and probably the colonies. All right? But Anna, not in company is running it. How do, no, I consider myself a historian or, or whatever. How do I, I put in a paper, she's running it. How do I know? And I provided some proof that determined for me. First of all, she lists herself as an iron master on three deeds that I found. If you don't do a lot of research early on on women, you don't know what that means. This is a woman with a, with a, with a job, with a vocation. She is an iron master. She is not a housewife. She is not the wife of Samuel Nutt. <coughs> Anna Nutt, Iron Master. That says everything. Um, I found several other entries that are on the handouts, and I didn't know how to do those. So if you look right below Samuel Nutt's will, I found that Abraham Ingle, Hingle was a teamster, and he carried iron and he, he carried iron from Coventry to Philadelphia. And if you read on there, received September the 10th, 1739, from Anna and Rebecca Nutt, 33 pigs. Okay. And also down below, received the Anna Nutt. She, he's hauling pigs. I also found a copy in Thomas Penn's journal that the Penn government was buying iron from Anna Nutt. Anna Nutt and Company. Okay. Um, an additional, um, Futhi and Cope show in 1739 
United, uh, colonies, England declared war against Spain. It was the War of Jenkins' ear. If you ever do any, they cut Jenkins, uh, captured Jenkins, uh, you know, cut his ear off and sent it to England, and, and they had a war. And nobody was signing up for this war, for the militia. So the Penn government decided if you're an indentured servant and you sign up for the militia, we'll waive the rest of your time. And that was great, except Anna Nutt and Warwick had almost all indentured servants. Okay, so suddenly they lose all their people that they've spent a whole lot of time and money training. Okay, and she's, she files a complaint. So Anna Nutt and company sue the Penn government. So that's some pretty strong stuff. Um, okay, um, the last thing, there we go, agreement between John Potts and Robert Grace. Now I told you that Rebecca got married to Robert Grace, he now is involved in everything, and he, I don't know how it worked back then, but he kind of owns half of Warwick, even though it's Rebecca's. He's at least managing it, okay? John Potts, who's Anna's other son-in-law, it's a great chart, oh, Applebee's was, John Potts, who's the other Applebee, in 1741 comes in, rents half of Robert Grace's property, and Anna Nutt kind of disappears at that time. All right, so between 1737 and 1741, Anna Nutt is running Warwick Furnace. In 1745, John Potts pays off a bunch of her bills. She writes her will, she doesn't die till 1760. She put, writes in her will, I give everything to John Potts. All her percentage. So. I'll tell you a funny story. We're getting hot, and it, I apologize. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, I went to Bucks County. I found I found the, the I found the deed that 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 John Potts bought from Robert Grace, half of Warwick. And I go in there, and I, I'm looking at it, and I found it, and Anna Nutt signs it. It was her signature. It was the first real signature of hers I saw. But as a somewhat of a add-on. George Taylor also signed it. He worked at Warwick, okay. He married, he became Anna Nutt's sons who dies, wife's second husband. All these folks married three or four times. So, I mean, anyhow, what's important about that is I looked at it, it was a real signature. And I remember re looking on the internet, this guy's signature is worth $20,000, just his signature because he went up to Durham, 1775, signed the Declaration of Independence, he was picked up there, and then he dies. George Washington's signature is worth a lot of money, but there's hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds. George signed everything. This guy didn't sign very much. And there's apparently a group of people, I don't know who they are, they'd have to be rich, that try to collect all the signers' signatures for the Declaration of Independence. And this is the second most valuable one. So. You know, so I go up to the librarian who's there, and it's quiet, and it's dark, and there's nobody else in there. And I'm, I'm whispering. We're the only one in this room. And I said, is, there any, is your boss here? No. Is there an archivist here? No. I said, well, this signature's worth a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, no, it is, $20,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I go back. I turn the page. And there's Anna Nutt's signature again on an original document. George Taylor's again. They inventoried everything that Potts rented. Everything, all the, the, how many pigs of iron they had, how many hammers they had, and so on. I'm looking what I think is $40,000 worth of signatures. Now, I got home. The last one at South, Sotheby sold for $80,000. So when I get home, I'm looking at $160,000 just to find John Potts and Anna Nutt. So, I, when I leave, I, had it, I, wanted, I was going to steal them and give them to somebody so she didn't lose them. Uh, I was probably the first one to look at it in a while. But, so I go back and say, look, these really are, okay. So she has a folder 
It's this old ratty folder that's from the 40s when they put it in there, and she writes valuable on it and puts it in her pile. So I said, oh, well, I want to go back. I do really want to go back and see if they did anything. All right. So that's the talk. Now the fun part. I want to compare why Rebecca Lukens floated to the top and why Anna Nutt floated to the top in a time when there was not a whole lot of floating going on. Okay, why did these two women float up into an area that was pure men? They ran it, they owned it, they worked at it. How did they do it? So this was the fun part. You can't compare the two, really. They're 100 years apart. World of differences in what's happening. It's like trying to compare airplanes, biplanes with jets. You know, they both fly, but that's it. But let's do it anyhow. So this was also done at Applebee's, so it may not be a various thing. All right, I had an old history professor who said we are because why? Personality and circumstances. He taught a course that I went to that was called Great Men Need Great Times. His theory was George Washington would have been a Virginia planner none of us ever heard of if the war, French and Indian War hadn't come along. We would not know him from Adam. Okay, it required great times. So circumstances. Now let me tell you two things about Rebecca, if you don't know. Her father was Isaac Pennock. He opened the Federal Saline Brandywine Mill. It became the Brandywine Nail and Iron Works and eventually became Lucan Steel. But he was an iron guy. She was his daughter. Okay, circumstances. They're both mature at the time. Anna Nutt is 50. Uh, Rebecca's 35 when they take over. Um, they had similar formative years. Both their fathers were iron guys. Both of them. They went down and played. Um, we're making this up, but they went down and played at the, at the you know, down at the foundry. Um, now, their fathers, again, were iron masters. Rudder at Pine Forge and Pennock at Brandywine. Their husbands were iron masters. Rebecca's husband, Samuel Nutt, was an iron master. Her husband, Dr. Lukens, who was running it, was an iron master. They died. They became widows. If they hadn't become widows, we wouldn't be talking about them right now. We'd be talking about Mr. Lukens and Mr. Rudder. All right. Personality. Here is the fun. My wife yelled at me about this one. Um, they're both first children. And they're both first female children. Rebecca was the oldest of five. Anna was the oldest of ten. Now, a whole lot's been done, and you've probably seen if you have kids, of what the personalities are of the first children versus the second children versus the third children. On um, the first children, they're driven, they're conscientious, they're competent beyond their years. Eight out of every ten CEOs is a single child, is a, is a single child or a first child. They just have different things. Second children are apparently more athletic, more competitive. I was a third child. I, got, I don't know what I am. I'm just <laughs> kind of lost. Um, and the biggest one that I didn't want to overlook, they were both Quakers. Okay? Both Quakers. Um, they were different times, and, and you have to put it in perspective, but both were educated. Anna Nutt was educated. She could write as well as her husband. And that was rare. Quakers treated women much more equally than everybody else. If you've done a little genealogical research, and I've done a lot of it, if you look at people from New England, pick a name, uh, Obadiah uh, Sh Shirky, whatever. Uh, it talks about Obadiah's parents, where he was born, what he did, how would he, you know, whatever, and wife Jane. You know, not wife Jane, daughter of, the boom, boom. It's a different thought process. And I'm trying to make the argument, I think, both the fact that they were first children, the circumstances opened it up, gave them a chance. Great people require great times. Uh, and they took them and run. So my conclusion here is, without question, for at least five years, Anna Nutt managed the construction and then operated one of Pennsylvania's foremost um, Iron producing properties. Um, 
Was she one of those fortunate individuals who find themselves in the middle of history making events? I don't know. But was she the first woman industrialist? I'll let you decide. I don't know. She certainly should be considered when we talk about women in the iron industry. So that's my story. And it's hot. <laughs> Is there any questions? We can take some questions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, whatever happened to when they filed the, um, the, the, the lawsuit or the case, did you, did you find anything that followed up? You know, I didn't. Uh, which, which case? The case when they went to the court when they were basically using their indentured servants. Okay, two, let me tell you. She, I forgot to mention one. <laughs> She also filed the new. She also filed against the new the, the his partner for stealing her ore. So she was involved in two court cases. I don't know. The Penn government paid other people, and she put in a claim for so much. I that I couldn't find how much she put in uh, for a hundred pounds or something that that cost them. The problem with indentured servants. That's why blacks became so important in the iron industry. They didn't get to leave. I train you. I have you. I train you, you're an indentured servant. Seven years later, you take your, your, your coat, your uh, suit of clothes that I have to give you, and you're gone, and all my training's gone. So interestingly enough, blacks in the iron industry, particularly at forges, received, did higher level jobs than indentured servants, okay, because they were there. So, but I don't know the answer to that. <coughs> Anything else? Yes, sir. Um. Do you know any of kind of like the back and forth that uh, Rebecca Grace and uh, Ben Franklin had? Yeah, okay, what, what he's talking about is this guy here, Robert Grace, was Benjamin Franklin's probably best friend. Grace lent him money. He gave, that's the other thing, that document that I found is historically important. Because it shows that Ben Franklin, I'm jumping a little bit here, Ben Franklin in his autobiography said, I gave my stove, my Franklin stove, to Robert Grace to produce at Warwick in 1742. I find a document that shows in 1741, Grace has already produced a bunch of them. <laughs> so, but what he's talking about was Robert Grace had Rebecca Savage. As a result of having Robert Grace, Rebecca meets Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. And the family came up with a bunch of stories, I can't presume, that Ben's, you know, Ben's like Franklin. When 17, whenever old Robert Grace dies, Franklin, you know, was a good friend. And supposedly, Caleb North, who was the sheriff of, Phil of Chester County, took Rebecca Savage in to Benjamin Franklin's deathbed, and she was the last person he saw. I can't say any of that. I, I don't know. Yes, sir. Um. I think Samuel Nutt, in his will, gave his share to Adam, brother Adam Nutt. He gave, no, he, which one? Well, I don't know. This guy owned everything. Yeah. He gave half to this guy and half to his wife. Okay, so Rebecca ends up with the half. He dies, so Rebecca ends up with the other half. All right. She gets everything. Okay, where did it go after that, you know? Uh, it stayed with them, and it stayed with him. Pots. These two sell their portion to this guy who married their daughter. And, and the Potts Mansion. Which one? In Pottstown? Mm -hmm. No. The one, is it by the Rebecca Furnace? Isabella. 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 Okay. I don't, I, I know that there's... So later. That's later. That's later. Yeah, it's okay. 1820s something. Okay. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. I have a little detailed question. Yes, ma'am. Um, now remember, Savage. it was done at, <laughs> at Applebee's, so it got me a break. Well, I'm looking at Samuel I used, Savage. I used beer, beer kind of things for those to give me my straight line. <laughs> well, it looks like he, he died when he was 30. Who? Which one? Samuel Savage. This Samuel Savage yeah, or this one? No, that one. That one. He died young. Yeah, and he was married when he was 14. Okay, so <laughs> so you think, now, you got to cut me, I was pulling these from, from like memory, so this is okay. pretty good. I ought to get yes. like something for oh, this. Oh, yeah. I agree. I think Sam, I'm, th I'm, he was 1760, he was probably at least 1680. I'd go back and look.
Uh -oh. um, I could never find where the savages are from. They might be from New England. They might be not. The Samuel Savage is too hard to trace. It's too easy. To no, no, that's good. Young. I've done sometimes like that before. So. But he, they married young in those days. So. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Yes, ma'am. The Robert Grace. Yes. Uh, was that family, that Grace family, um, connected with the Grace Mines up in the Morgan County area? No. Mm -hmm. No? He was a rich kid, actually. He ended up with his grandmother's house in Philadelphia. He went to England, interesting enough, became a metallurgist, studied, studied, oh, in fact, he went to Germany, he went to a couple places, and he came back. So when he took over Rebecca Savage's thing, it wasn't like we were giving him to, a, to you know, like me or something. He knew what, what it was about. So he was, he, was, uh, he was rich, too. But he married, I put, if you look at the, didn't I put on the first page? Look on the first page at the very top with the, with the uh, picture. Franklin knew him, so Franklin noted their marriage in the paper. A general, what does it say? An agreeable young lady that's rich. Yeah, that's pretty. Can't beat agreeable young ladies that are rich. So. All right, if nobody has anything else, I have put my email address on there. If you have any questions, I always get a bunch. It's just easier than asking me after questions. Write me, and I'm more likely to do it at my time and give you a better answer. And I apologize about the heat. I'm sorry about that. But everybody stayed awake pretty much, so that was good. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It was an enjoyable uh, presentation there. I will tell you about our next event that we're having. At the moment, it is scheduled for Saturday, April 7th. So we are changing up the date and the time. Uh, we will have somebody from Independent Seaport Museum come on down here. We're going to talk about submersibles. Uh, the reason why we're having this is if you're not aware, we did receive the Guppy submersible as part of our collection just last Friday. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have a presentation in here and then we'll take a walk down to our murder house and you can all see the Guppy as part of, as part of the event as well. Uh, time and date may change, but for now it's Saturday, April 7th, probably about 10 a.m. So we're going to do it before lunch. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you all then. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where is there were two Rebecca furnaces? You think with all the names they could name it, they wouldn't name it. There were two Rebecca furnaces.